Hi everybody, uh, Hank Winchester here from Local 4 along with Roseanne Coppola, Ro Coppola. Ro <laughs> not is Karen a, Drew. Not Karen Drew, Ro is our executive producer of special projects and she was involved with us in the Grant case from beginning to end. Karen Drew is out on a story right now which is why she is not able to be with us. Uh, but we wanted to take an opportunity today uh, on the 10th anniversary of the murder investigation of Tara Grant to take a look back on that case. But as we were talking about earlier today, First of all, we couldn't believe it's been I, 10 years. I can't even. The time has flown. It flew by. Right. But, you know, on a day like this, obviously, our thoughts are with Tara's family. Always. And, and with Tara, uh, knowing what uh, the family went through and what they endured during this entire saga. But it's one of those cases, like I was telling you also, where to this day, you know, um, it's something that people always mention to me and bring up to me because it was a case that I think captured the attention of so many people. And we, and we, you in particular, we lived and breathed this case and, and you, you get attached to the family and, and what they were going through and watching what was happening. Yeah. Even 10 years later, the second we hear the, the name Tara Grant, it brings us right back. Yeah. In fact, you know, to give you kind of some inside perspective on all of it, I can remember the night uh, when <clears throat> her body was discovered in the garage and when it all wrapped up and the hours after you know uh, being out there and following that case i remember coming back to your office and just kind of it all hit right. me, you know just in that dropped. night right. yeah because we'd become you know and you, you try to you you work your best you do your best rather to to make sure you're presenting all sides of the story and and covering this um, from every angle, but you can't help but to form some sort of an attachment with... And that entire day, you didn't even let yourself think about what was right, happening. Right. You know, you, you were in the garage where they found the body hours later. Yeah. Um, and then we watched Stephen Grant disappear on the air, right? Yeah. Live on our air, yeah. he walked away with the dog, which is things we'll, we'll, we'll talk about coming up here. Yeah. Uh, and the entire day went, and then by the time you got back, it was 12.30 at night. And that's yeah. when you first let yourself think about it. And I just remember you collapsing in my office. Yeah, right? yeah. maybe not that dramatic. It wasn't a full that dramatic. collapse. It might have been, but it was just, um, you know, it was one of those things where we, like Rose said, it was every waking hour for three weeks it was all that we were we were both working you know 18 right. hour days, days every right. day and and i was in constant communication with alicia tara's sister and and she was hoping that you know i might be able to give her some insider info and at the same time you know we didn't realize Steven, but right. i was in a uh, very constant uh communication with stephen grant um who at first you know the call seemed very normal and you know he was a man who was wanting to get information about his wife get it out there to the media um, and, and that all seemed very logical I mean I'm never one to judge people when somebody is missing or when they're dealing you with a tragedy face value. because yeah. you never really know how you would react uh, yourself and it wasn't really until the second week um, when I started thinking, okay, this guy's a little... Well, he was also asking you questions about whether he should go for a run or if it looked weird or, or right, things yeah. that seemed out of sorts for what was happening in his yeah, life. Yeah, he would ask me, um, you know, to give you some perspective on the conversations, he would, he would you know, he would call me and usually the, the conversation would begin with questions about what we could do to get uh, the news out about Tara being missing and that's all very normal. Uh, but then, as Ro mentioned, you know, there were times where he would call me and he'd say, like, listen, you know, I, I miss going for my morning jog. Is it going to look weird if the cameras capture me working out? Or one time he called me and asked me to meet him up at a bar to play trivia, uh, which I did not do. <laughs> um, <laughs> nothing against trivia. Right. I just thought it would be a little strange to um, meet him in that environment uh, publicly. Um, and, and it wasn't like he was saying, I want to meet you here to, to share more information or to give you um, some perspective on something. I think he just wanted a friend or somebody to hang out with. And, he and also started enjoying the publicity, too. He liked, right. I, I think, we thought, he liked hearing, you know, hearing himself on television, seeing himself on television. Right, which was another red flag. <laughs> right. When, uh, when I would do a live report and I would finish it, and I would be off the air within 15 seconds my phone would ring and it would be Steven and it wasn't a conversation about you know I wish you would have included this information or can we get this out there right. it was I didn't really like the lighting of you know how, how I looked 
um, I wanted to, to change things up a little bit. So it was, uh, especially during those phone conversations, I remember calling you and thinking like, okay. Right, <laughs> yeah, it's crazy. Something's, something's not right here. But I mean, for you, you know, kind of, you know, I was, you know, out there, but, you know, you were at the time managing myself, Mark Santia, Karen Drew. Right, Kevin. Kevin Deed. So, you know, we would all kind of use Roe as our point person to say, this is what we're working on. This is what we have. But I mean, it seemed like there was such an interest in that case that we dedicated a lot of we time. We dedicated all of our resources to it, honestly. Yeah. I mean, here we had we had a young mother, young kids, you know, gone missing. It had all the makings of a big story. Everyone cares, especially when there are kids left without a mother. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it was in and around Valentine's Day, which had a little hook there. Yeah. It started getting national attention. Yeah. Um, and we knew, we had a feeling that there was more to this than, than just a mom who needed some time and, and was stuck in Puerto Rico. Yeah. And then yeah. stories came, you know, there was a nanny situation involved and it, be, it became um, every single day just trying to keep the story alive. Yeah. Really. I mean, it really was. And that's, that takes us to the day um, when the discovery was made. And this isn't really something we've ever talked about before, but, you know, the reason we got that video of him walking in the snow and the way all that played out um, was I was preparing to do a live shot in front of the Macomb County Jail. It was about uh, five o'clock. And I'd been talking to Stephen throughout the day about getting video, Christmas video. Right. Because we thought, you know, it's, it's one thing to see an image of somebody, but when you see moving video, it helps make them more relatable or maybe more identifiable. <coughs> Excuse me. And we also wanted to make, <coughs> keep the story alive in hopes of finding her alive. That was the goal. Right. And, and, Always. And, you know, whatever we could do to help the police investigation moving forward. But that particular day, he called me and said, I have this video. Um, and I remember calling back to you and said, he has a video. Should we leave? the jail and go to his house it's about 15 minutes away and so we did that live shot at five and in the drive over mark santia had gotten information that they were about to raid the house right. and so when i started to pull up towards the neighborhood um steven was in the back of a police car and and mark was mark had video of that because he knew where to stake that. it out because of sources and things like that so we found ourselves perfectly placed to cover the story we didn't know that as you as we, we saw. didn't know at that point right because he, he told me that as I was driving over that he specifically wanted me to interview him in the, garage. in the garage and I said why the garage you know it just seemed weird well at the time I didn't know that her body was in the garage and so he was trying to get somebody you know we talked to clinical psychologists about it many he wanted, times after. He wanted right. to get somebody as close to the crime scene right. as possible um, without revealing what had happened but and while our cameras were rolling he also stepped out of the house they were searching the house right at yeah. that time well they had they had right. shown uh, the search warrant and um he asked if he could step outside and take the dog, dog for, for a walk, walk. And, and he took the dog for a walk and never returned never returned and so then you know we got by that time it was almost six o'clock and i'd called back here you got the chopper over the house i mean it was just uh it was quite a scene but it took us about it took about an hour for the police to reveal, understand, to, right. to understand, right. to make the discovery, and then to turn around and say, "Where's Where Stephen?" <laughs> and he's gone. Um, so then that, of course, led to the whole series of events heading up north, and right. Where, um, and then was, Coast Guard rescuing him and all things like that. We yeah, should, I saw Karen should, Drew. Where did she Why don't we throw to the, your piece? Yeah, let's take a look at one of the stories. Right. This is from. And then Karen will be back. And Karen just <laughs> when walked I'm in. Done. Um, she was obviously very attached to the investigation. Went to Puerto Rico. Um, and because Germany. that's where uh, Tara Grant had last been seen alive and, and was also in Germany searching for the au pair. So we'll talk to Karen about that when she gets back. But take a look at a story uh, from 2012. It is the one story viewers always ask me about the murder of Tara Grant. Now, five years after that shocking crime, we show you how Tara's sister Alicia and the Grant children are doing. We also reveal Stephen Grant's dramatic transformation. This was Stephen Grant then, those wild eyes, his wild stories. Should you be a suspect in this investigation? I don't know. Grant was trying to throw off the media and investigators by making up stories about his wife and her life. She at the time was having a, a relationship with, with, with another man. Um, it was mostly on the phone. But that was Grant before the truth came out in 2007. Take a look at Stephen Grant today, captured in a recent mugshot. 
Grant has gained a significant amount of weight in prison. He works folding laundry, but clearly isn't working out. February 9, 2007, Tara Grant returned home from a business trip in Puerto Rico. Little did Tara know Stephen was plotting her murder. That night, Tara Grant was strangled in her bedroom by her own husband. Stephen waited a few days before reporting Tara missing, but soon her face was everywhere. People were desperately trying to locate the missing mother. Her husband Stephen seemed concerned at first, but later seemed like he was hiding something. If Tara is out there, what would you say right now? Call the sheriff's office. Don't you want her to call you? Grant's story started to fall apart and police suspected he was involved. Armed with a search warrant, investigators made their way inside the Grant home and discovered Tara's torso hidden in a storage container in the garage. Investigators then called Tara's sister Alicia to break the news. I was horrified. I think I, I think I let out a scream. I was just horrified. I could not believe what they were telling me. Tara Grant's remains were not only found inside her home, but also scattered in nearby Stony Creek Metro Park. A trial soon followed. Alicia Standifer was in the courtroom for every minute of testimony. I, I had eye contact with him the entire time. He bounced his eyes off of me. Soon after the criminal trial wrapped, the battle for custody got underway. Alicia ultimately won custody of Grant's two children, Lindsay and Ian. The children were told what happened to their mother. They know dad is in prison. They now call Alicia mom and rarely mention or ask about their father. They continue to go through counseling, but have adjusted to life in Ohio with Alicia, her husband, and her own two children. You know, every single night we say our prayers and every single night they both pray for mom and the fact that, that she is their number one angel and that they miss her a lot. Alicia has tried to move forward, but that wasn't possible for some people close to the investigation. Stephen Grant's father, Al Grant, killed himself in 2008. The murder devastated Mr. Grant and sent him into a deep depression. David Graham was Stephen Grant's attorney early on in the investigation. Today, Graham has another high-profile client. He's now representing Bob Bashara, whose wife was murdered a little more than two weeks ago. Mark Hackle was the Macomb County Sheriff when this crime played out. Today, Hackle serves as the Macomb County Executive. Stephen Grant's sister, Kelly Udikansky, still lives in Metro Detroit. She visits her brother in prison. She has limited contact with the Grant children. Stephen Grant sits alone in a prison cell. The first time he's eligible for parole, he'll be 80 years old. Tonight, though, the focus isn't on Stephen, although it's probably what he would like. The focus instead on Tara, remembering a loving mother, sister, and friend. To honor her sister's memory, Alicia Stanifer has been working with Turning Point, an organization here in Metro Detroit. They're dedicated to helping women that are in abusive relationships. For more information about Turning Point, just head to our website, click on Detroit.com. All the information will be on the Defender page. I'm Local 4 Defender Hank Winchester. Back. Wow. So that was a story that we did on the five-year anniversary of the murder of Tara right. Grant. I can't um, believe it's been 10 years. I know, and you look at the video, too, and so many of those, those faces you saw in that video are still people that are you know, very out front. Uh, Mark Hackle now is the Macomb County Executive, right. no longer the sheriff. But David Grimm, who was the attorney for Stephen Grant at the time, then uh, fired him live on the air. I remember. I was anchoring was that found. morning. You were anchoring that yeah, morning. Yeah, I was anchoring I was that Petoskey. morning, and then I just, I remember hearing him say, and I need to let you know I'm not representing you anymore. I mean, that was, that was just everything. It seemed every single day there was such a huge development. Yeah. And it was so surprising. Yeah. I remember, in fact, you know, Karen had a lot of, elements working the story, traveling to Puerto Rico, traveling to Germany, but I do remember that particular day you're talking about when David Grimm fired him because I remember the night before calling you, almost kind of hyperventilating, because Stephen was on the run and yeah. had called my phone. Right. And I think I was talking to somebody at the station, so I didn't answer it, and he left a voicemail. And so we had a lot of you know, conversations about do we air that voicemail, um, do we give that to police. We did contact the police because they were trying to ping his phone. But the voicemail was just him kind of hysterical, you know, call me right away, I need right. to talk to you, I need to talk to you about something. And Driving away, away in I mean, that big yellow truck. Big, Remember a, a bright yellow, yellow truck, truck it was going a neighbor's up. truck. Yeah. yeah, going up there 
uh, to the what whatever state park that was. Yeah, that's where he had on he and Tara s spent their honeymoon at that state park, and that's ultimately where he went to go try to hide. And then how many hours was he hidden about? Do you on remember? The run? No, on the run, but like he well, I guess the total because you don't know how long he was at the park. But I remember because remember when he came out, he was frostbit on his hands they took and him his out feet. out in one of those baskets. Um, because the he'd Coast been Guard. running, you know, when, you, when you're when you frostbitten like that, your body, your mind kind of tricks you and makes you think that you're really warm. So he had been taking off all of his clothes as he was running through the park. Right. Um, but they used a lot of uh, tech, technology choppers with heat sensors and body right. sensors. I mean, it was all hands on deck up north. And yes, the police um, let him get away that particular day didn't play out like the way yeah. it should have, but they were able to apprehend him. He was still alive. And ultimately, uh, you know, that was a big, long trial here back in Macomb now County. You've had, I know he always wanted to communicate to you as much as he could, but behind bars, obviously, that's limited. Um, talk to me about what that relationship was like. Well, you can after. see him there I with mean, his there. phone. Um, he he really, he, he <coughs> relished being in the spotlight. He liked uh, the media attention. And, and at the time, you know, for us, it was, you know, wanting to get the word out that she was missing and having the husband make himself available. Um, you can see how different he looks now in prison. Right. Um, having the husband make himself available and his sister help tell the story of, of who Tara was. I've only heard from him twice in the last 10 years since he's been locked up and he wrote me letters uh, from prison. Uh, we have not shared what those. What type of angle of letter? More of us keeping it in was, touch or yeah, more he wanted, of, he wanted to get his story still out there again? No, it was more of kind of like a, like a one page letter, how you doing, just whatever. And he asked me to come see him in prison. And so we did one day, we drove to Ionia where he's locked up at Bellamy Creek, they would not allow us to take a camera. And our idea was that we would go in and have a conversation with him, see what, what he really wanted, and then try to figure out if you know there was a story to do, but also making sure that we were sensitive and, and careful with the family. Because you know I was in constant touch and still talked to Alicia from time to time. Right. So we wanted to handle it appropriately. But we got to the jail. Did the whole background check, did the whole search, yada, yada, yada. And then the guard came out and said, Stephen said he is having a bad day today. And he never had that meeting. And doesn't want to. So, yeah. So then from that point on, um, I, haven't, I haven't talked to him or heard from him um, since that time. But, but you, you see the sister a, there. It just I breaks know. my heart looking at her. I just think of, oh, I know. It's so um, but no, you I very the, early I did on. The, I did the... Um, well, first, we did the whole, she's Puerto in Puerto Rico. Rico. She had the office down there, and at that point, we didn't know where she was. Yeah. It was all, like you said, all hands on deck. Everyone was trying to figure out where she was. There was posters going up in Michigan, and that's when they said, well, she worked there. Maybe, And she'd know, been there. She had been there. Very and then, recently. remember, his story was that she got mad at him. Yeah. And she went in a dark sedan. In that Puerto picked Rico. Her up. No, well, they got, oh, from the house. Right, they had a fight yeah. at the house. Yeah. His story is that she got picked up in a dark sedan and yeah. she was going back to Puerto Rico, is what he told, he told police. Yeah. So then we said, well, I mean, we, we didn't really believe it, but you had to try. So I remember I went to Puerto Rico and went to her office and even the people in her office weren't willing to talk. It was They a released little... a statement, though, saying that they were concerned for mm -hmm. her, but they had not seen her. They and... hadn't seen her. We, I mean, we actually put up some like flyers just because we thought, well, what if... I mean, you never know. Maybe she did go back, or maybe there was, and we stayed there for a while, and that was just a total dead end. But then you came back, and it was almost like you got back, and within days, the story broke that there was some connection between Stephen Grant and the au pair. Verena Derkus. Verena Derkus. From and Germany. She had split, and she'd gone back to Germany. And then the next thing I know... I was on a plane to Germany. You're on a plane to Germany, and I'm driving... Up north. Wait, did I go up north? For, I went Kevin down, went up to the park. Kevin went up he north. Got, yeah, he was freezing. He, no, he went to the um, cabin that the family owned in the UP. Right. Because we weren't at the park yet, because she's still a missing person right now. Right. I went down to Chillicothe, Ohio, which That's is where, where the, kids the were. sister... No, the sister lived there. Right, but she, she had the kids at the time. No, though. the kids are still living with Stephen. Because right, right now he's just he's the still, husband. You're right, you're right. Yeah. Right. yeah. Yep. So we drove down to Chillicothe, Ohio, and I just said to Alicia on the phone, I said, hey, will you just meet me for coffee at your local coffee shop in Chillicothe? Mm -hmm. And um, she did, and she brought her mom. And they hadn't talked 
publicly yet. And, and then her mom said, you know, it's time for us to... And I think they had suspicion. They just... From the beginning, they felt like something wasn't right. They, they weren't always... buying Stephen's story. It just seems strange. I remember the one day they were doing a search for her at Stony Creek, and he was getting his hair cut. Yeah. Remember, yeah. he contacted you and said, hey, do you want to interview me? I'm at, like... He wanted me to go play trivia with him. But that, that but, day... But, yeah, like, who... <laughs> if your wife is missing, you're either on the search or you're just so overwhelmed with grief. You're not. Yeah. But you're not just at the local barber getting your hair cut. That was where things... It was clear to us working closely with police and talking to him a lot where there was now a divide. It was clear, yeah. Where the police weren't saying, hey, we want your help. We want to hear from you. Help us put the pieces together. Instead, it was, we're doing our own thing, and we're keeping an eye on you. Well, remember, too, that video they got of him at the gas station across from the Macomb County Jail? Yeah. He would go in the morning and buy all the papers to see himself on the headlines. Yeah. And that was just weird. Why yeah. would you do that? I mean, like I was telling, talking with Roe, I mean, there were so many things early on about it that were... Um, within the second week where we had you know, been talking a lot. But by the time that second week turned where he would start asking weird questions about, can I get a haircut? Should I go jogging? Do you want to play trivia? I thought, okay, this is getting weird. Very strange. And you were never fearful? No. Like the day, I mean, the, the big day. The, the day when he says, come to my house and look at my Christmas video. The right day he the escapes. Garage, well, yeah. he doesn't really escape. He was free. But the day he takes up. You were never, ever fearful, like, going into a garage to meet him? No, because it didn't seem... But you knew he... I knew he time, was a little cuckoo, but, I mean, we didn't had... You, but we all talked about him being the killer. I had a photographer with me, Sue Dice. I, I knew Santia was parked down the road. We had both been in touch with police throughout the day. One of the cops who I talked to a lot knew where I was going. But then once I got there, um, you know, it That's was... So nothing... When he said, I want you to interview me in the garage, there wasn't anything that went off in my mind where I thought, I can't, not the I garage. Not I just thought, okay, not outside. It's cold out. You know, nothing... But looking back, don't you odd. realize? Well, like, now, looking back on okay, it... Okay, I just want to make sure you'll never yeah. do something like that again. Well, still, again, The no. interview is important. I get it. But, I mean, that just seemed very... I mean, nothing he was doing was making sense. Right. So the the request for I want you to come to the garage didn't seem crazy to me. Um, it was all and really And part of about, her body was in the garage. In those yes, her containers. torso was in a Rubbermaid um, yeah. container. And, um, yeah, I, I just, you know, getting up there and... Um, <laughs> I just got a text from a friend of ours who's watching on Facebook who was connected. I know him. Yes. yes. He see um, you. Uh, was involved in the case. And, um, you know, I will say this. I will, you know, say this very clearly. The sheriff's department um, and that team really worked diligently, not only to get the information out that she was missing, but once that situation escalated to the point where Stephen had taken off and he was running, it was all hands on mm -hmm. deck. And they had really great co cooperation with teams from up north. I mean, the, the, the focus was finding this guy and getting him alive. Right. Um, and they did. And, and they, they did. did that with no one injured, no one hurt, got him back. And they did. And, you know, got him in front of a judge yeah. finally. And it was a, you know, a really emotional, wild trial, too, because they brought back. Remember, Marina they Derkis, brought her back. She was so nervous. Can you imagine? No. She's like 21 years old. First of all, you come to this country to be an au pair, to take care of children and to see America. Yeah. And that turns into some horrific sexual escapade. Yeah. Where, remember, at one time, and you would correct me if I'm wrong, wasn't there some holes that were drilled in the wall in her room? Well, they. They had had sexual contact. I know they did, yeah. but I thought like the holes were... Maybe. I could be, Okay, but Maybe. I just remember reading, I thought part of that. But yeah, they had a sexual relationship. Then she takes off after all of this breaks. Yeah. I mean, I'm sure And then gets back to like, Germany. The well, I remember when I went to Germany, we went to her house. Mm -hmm. and her dad was furious we showed up, which I can understand if you're a father. You're thinking, I just sent my daughter to America. Yeah. She came back and... And you're just trying to figure out more about. We were just him at that point. We weren't trying to yell at her or anything. We were just trying to get some answers. We thought maybe if she was back in her homeland, she'd be willing to maybe say what happened because yeah. everything was so secretive. And she had just gotten on the plane and went back home, and they were didn't want to talk. But then when she showed up at court, 
Yeah, that I was... I just remember everyone felt for her because she was scared uh, and she didn't even want to look at him and she, she was, was looking down and her hands were shaking. She was shaking and who wouldn't be? I mean, you're Well, if you realize what he case, did to he did. Tara. And you know, when you're testifying like that... You have to look at him. You're, well, you don't have to necessarily make eye contact. But you him, know he's in that room. But you're 10 feet away from him and you do have to identify who he is um, at the beginning of your testimony. Um, so I, you know, for her, that testimony was unbelievable. For Alicia Standerford, the sister, her testimony um, was incredible. And you know, the the bar. Look the, at those kids those right kids. there. Oh, and you know, I will breaks. tell you. You wonder how they're doing now, in the sense of, you know, they have such a different life. They moved to Ohio to live with their aunt. Any questions? I'm sure they know. Maybe some, but not all of their history. I mean, it's almost like starting a whole new life, and you never really want to share your history. Yeah, I mean, they were the kids, if, if you can look back at it and say that they were fortunate in any regard, it's that they had Alicia oh, she was and her husband, kid. Eric. So they did, after Stephen was found guilty, there was a little bit of a custody battle, and you can see Stephen's sister, Kelly, there. Um, a custody battle as to who was going to get the kids. Ultimately, they they went to Alicia, and you know they, like any kid that would be taken from a situation like that. I'm sure there were bumps in the road, but right. they're doing really well. They no longer live in Ohio. Uh, they've moved, um, but they're doing I think is as good as can be expected. You know, Alicia has kids of her own, and so they just kind of blended this family. And right. um, she's a she's a great woman, and her husband Eric was so supportive through through all of this but like I was talking about with Roe it's some um, when we talked about the anniversary of this today it was, your first thought went to Tara mm -hmm. it's not about Steven no um, you just think of the horrificness of what happened physically to her and the children and and then the and for what you know for what right you know yeah because he had a crush on the au pair you know yeah. I mean it just doesn't it just doesn't make any sense. But it also makes you look at different murder investigations differently or missing persons investigations differently. Uh, some of the same players from Stephen Grant were involved in Bob Bashara. Yeah. Um, uh, David Grimm at one time represented both. That is right, yeah. Um, and, you know, we have this case out of Farmington Hills right now where a, a young lady is missing. And, and again, Danielle you, Sislicki. Yeah, and you've talked with her parents. And so your brain kind of goes to, okay, take, you know, bring me back to the Grant case or the Bashara case, like what happened A, B, C, D, you know? Right. Trying to put the pieces of a puzzle together and sometimes the puzzle's easier to mm -hmm. put together um, and other times it's um, more challenging. So, um, yeah, it was, um, it was a wild case. I got so, and people wrote books. They did, there was a- There were a couple books. Uh, and there was a I person, was... like a court watcher who, um, went to the trial and I'm, I know he visited Stephen in jail and he wrote um, some version of a book that didn't have the support of Alicia mm -hmm. or any of the family and then he also wrote a book on the Bashara case too. Dateline covered both of those right. stories uh, extensively. If you ever were back in front of Stephen what would be your question? What would I you say I think I just wanted, wanted, would want to know why. You know I think I know the answer. I think I think it's just like with the Bob Bashara case. I think Bob thought um, he could get away with he it. He could get away with this, and he was going to create this new life with right. uh, Rachel, uh, this mistress of his. And I think Stephen thought, well, maybe I'll create a new life with the okay. If I take the wife out of the picture, right. right, get rid of the wife, and then create a new life. And I think in, in both of those cases, that's what they thought they were going to be able to do. Right. You know? It just, it's just so hard to grasp because it clearly... And both uh, mothers of two children. Right. A boy and a girl. That is um, true. Both lived in suburban areas. Um, white, upper, middle class. Right. Um, That's what I was, remember a lot of people in the neighborhood used to comment, like, Stephen Grant, he was the guy at the bus stop every morning with yeah. the kids. And, you know... Because and he, she worked. He did She worked. She traveled, as we mentioned, to Puerto yeah. Rico a lot. But, but, you know, he seemed like the sweet neighborhood dad. And, yeah. I think, I don't remember if we ran on, if there were domestic calls to the house before. I don't recall if there was or not. I don't not. think, I, I think looking back on it and talking with the family too a lot, um, Kevin Dietz is just walking by. He was also very involved in the case. 
he was up north. Maybe he'll talk to us, Kevin Dietz. He seems very um, busy. I know that there was a lot of uh, the family members in talking about the relationship, there was a lot of animosity. Stephen felt inferior because Tara had this very successful career. She was college educated. Um, in fact, you know, we talked about her career and her job in Puerto Rico. Let's take a look at one of the stories when we traveled. Is this a story when we traveled down to Puerto Rico? I think so. Uh, with that would your be work heading yeah. down to Puerto Rico, so take a look. Tara Grant, a mother and wife, and now a household name. Tonight, major new developments in her disappearance. A massive search gets underway tomorrow in Metro Detroit. This is Local 4 uncovers new information that's leading investigators all the way to Puerto Rico. And only Rescue 4 has reporters live in both Puerto Rico and in Metro Detroit working on this story. Puerto Rico is where Tara was supposed to go on business but never arrived. And we've learned investigators here in Metro Detroit are working with agents there as they search for Tara. So let's get to Karen Drew live in Puerto Rico. And she's been talking with Tara's co-workers. Karen? Devin, it has been a very busy day in Macomb County and a very, very busy day here in San Juan, Puerto Rico. Investigators have been notified about this case. Rescue 4, meantime, has been walking the streets near her office building, asking anyone, have you seen her? Do you know anything? What has happened to Tara Grant? A busy afternoon as Rescue 4 takes pictures of Tara Grant, showing them to those who worked in her downtown San Juan building. The men at the front desk say she looked familiar but didn't know anything else. So we ask if they can post her photos asking for anyone's help on this case. Next, we go to a gym right next to Tara's office building. Again, no luck or information on what happened to the 34-year-old Washington Township woman. Meantime, Rescue 4 was able to get inside the Washington Washington Group International Office, where Tara was a manager. Her co-workers reluctant to talk. Meantime, Rescue 4 learning new information tonight about the last trip made here by Stephen Grant and his wife. It was January 18th. They were together celebrating Stephen's birthday, enjoying the sights of the Caribbean. Tonight, an eerie calmness as authorities wonder, could this tropical island hold the key to Tara's disappearance? Meantime, I did just get off the phone with an FBI agent here in San Juan, Puerto Rico. He did tell me that there are some developments in this case. I actually have a one-on-one -on -one meeting with him tomorrow morning, so I will be sharing with you that information. And also, as we said, some new information about this last trip Stephen Grant and Tara Grant made here to San Juan. We'll be working on that part of the story tonight and bringing you those developments at 11. We're live in San Juan, Puerto Rico. Karen Drew, Rescue 4. Uh, Karen, how much are you getting the sense that this, is, that this story is making news there? Do you find that uh, you you're telling most people about it, or do already people there have an idea of what's going on? If you go into her office building, people know it, whether or not they worked with her. There's uh, probably about 24 floors in that building, and I was holding the picture, and they said, oh, yes, you know, they recognized the name or the picture. Out on the street, though, not so much. Yeah. But also, though, speaking with local authorities, they have been made aware of her disappearance, and so it's kind of a mixed bag right now, and that could take a turn. All right, we'll look for Karen's reports later on tonight. More from San Juan. Thanks, Karen. Bye. What's hard on that is I remember being hopeful. Yeah. At that point, yeah. like, okay, well, fine. She's not in Puerto Rico, but then she'll be somewhere. There'll be uh, Mike. I honestly thought initially, you know, she just wanted to get away from them. You know how you just have a domestic situation, and maybe you're like, I'm taking a taking some time. That was what I was hoping for, but of course, most moms don't leave their kids. Yeah, behind. that was, that the, was the only problem. That like, was if the you thing wanted that was to weird. get away, she had two kid, young kids, you wouldn't leave her kids. And she was such a devoted mom in talking with her family members, and you know, she traveled a lot for work, mm -hmm. but you know, she was the scheduler, the planner, the yeah. figure it all out. And you know, like you said, it would be very highly uncharacteristic right. of her, her just to, to just take off. vanish like that yeah. on her own. Um, so yeah, you know, today is is a day when we, uh, you know, think about Tara, when we think about Alicia, her children, everyone involved. Um, it's just uh, really one of the most heartbreaking stories that I've ever covered or been involved in. Because as you mentioned, it, like you said, there was this hope and this optimism that everything right. would be okay. And then to to know that not only was she murdered, the way it the occurred, the way she was murdered, and and the insane 
path that it took after that. It just um, really made you get inside the mind of a crazy person. Right. And of a killer. Of a killer. And you realized what a horrific situation it is. So today, that is, uh, you know, our intention is to remember the life of Tara Grant, the woman she was, the mother that she was. And um, I know a lot of the uh, rescue organizations in Macomb County have been very involved in, in her effort. And just reminding people, if you feel like you're in a situation doesn't feel right if you feel like your significant other or your sp whoever uh, could put you in danger to reach out for help and that's something that you know her family always said that they that there were warning signs right. and they wished that she had done something mm -hmm. filed a report made a phone call because many times a you know response sometimes is based on oh was there a problem before or yeah. you know do you need a PPO or you know it depends on the level that yeah. it goes to but yeah. um but it is recognizing the signs and, and doing something. Yeah, yeah. So our thoughts uh, with Tara's family members today, with Alicia, with her husband Eric, with the two children. Uh, we're going to have more coverage at ClickOnDetroit.com, mm -hmm. some of our older stories. I know you saw the story that Karen did in Puerto Rico, our timeline from time years, five years ago. So you'll find those at ClickOnDetroit.com. Thank you for tuning in here on Facebook. And uh, we'll continue to follow the story and, yeah. and continue to update people on on any you know information regarding the children if the family feels like that's appropriate uh, but for now um, we'll send it back thanks for joining us today